Uh, Elric. <laughs> the thrilling adventures of ML Elric are on the air. Brought to you each week at this time by your neighborhood Red Shovel Network. These dramatizations are designed to demonstrate forcibly to old and young alike that crime does not pay. You ass in a rag and your finger out of my face. face. Get your finger out of my face. Yes, take the first shot, then if you want to count. Get counsel, your finger out of my face. It's gone. What are you doing? What are you doing? Come on. That is not paid for by them. That is paid for by the people of Detroit. Let me tell you something. You want to go right now? Okay? You want to go right now, Elric? Hello, my good friends. It's your old pal, M.L. Elric of Fox 2 Detroit, investigative reporter, sometimes radio fill-in host, and your host here at uh, M.L. Soul of Detroit. I have heard that live radio can be very chaotic, and it's good to know that recorded Radio can be very chaotic, too. We have had some curveballs thrown at us, but we are going to soldier along. And uh, trying to keep us on track is Mark Fellhauer. Hello. Co-pilot, um, demigod, and uh, co-host of the Charlotte and Dad podcast, which Just, is... Uh, is that on hiatus, Charlotte and Dad, or is there an episode um, in the works? There's always an episode in the works. Okay. <laughs> I okay. suppose so you, you're like the Larry she, David of podcasting. Yeah, she really runs her schedule is the most important thing. Oh, so Charlotte's the Larry David of podcasting. Yeah, uh-huh. it'd be a lot cool if you were the Leon of podcasting. <laughs> the president of uh, uh, hitting that ass, Danny uh, Dubernick, or who's the character he does all the time? What Duberstein? Doesn't he do? Uh, he does some crazy. Ca- okay, sorry, I got to get cable. <laughs> but uh, this is a perfect transition to talk about Sean Windsor, who is contributing by not being here. He will be joining us later on uh, a payphone in a rest stop bathroom to give us perhaps the latest update on the next coach of the just betrayed University of Michigan basketball oh, team. The, the John that. Beeline era ended I, I would like worse to, than the Game of Thrones era, or so I'm led to believe. I would like to point out, because I thought of you when I saw the story. The he, one about all the recruits bailing on him, the one about how the, the university can't hire a good coach because it's too late in the process. Which, which one of that was that? The fact that he came back for the charity auction for Chad Tuff oh. because they asked him to be the chair. Cool. And it was less than a week after he departed for Cleveland, and he still did it. He's a yeah. stand-up guy. He's he's not a man uh, who's irredeemable. He just didn't do much to help his team or the university. Other than rebuilding that uh, program. Well, and then put a gun to their head for an extension and a raise and then walk out in the middle. Not even the middle of the contract. I think they'll be fine. The I think both parties will be fine. You know who thinks who I think is going to be fine? Your Michigan State Spartan basketball team, led yeah. by the immovable, the the loyal Thomas... Ignatius Izzo. Or maybe he changed his middle taint name. Why does everything well. have to be seen through the, the prism of both teams? Oh, it doesn't. It's just okay. uh, just well, one. He's not part of this conversation. You brought him up. One prism shows a bright, shining light. The other one looks like uh, like uh, the Love Canal. I'm happy with it. Don't worry a, about us. It contains we'll be fine. body of water. We're the uh, most myopic fans in the world. We'll be fine. Yes. Uh, speaking of myopic, uh, Dr. Yalo can fix that, but we'll get to that in a minute. Look at that. Yes, we like to go from eye problems to our sponsors. No, we, we, we want to go to a, a sponsor who can fix your mortgage woes. In fact, I met in person the first time today Mr. David Hall, who I've seen many times on TV, heard many times on the radio, and we may be refinancing my little rental property in East Lansing, so I'll, I'll let you know how that goes. Come on, your house sucks. The most important relationship between old M.L. Elric and David Hall is that he is a sponsor of the Red Shovel Network. And I can't emphasize enough how important it is that people like David are to our survival, taking a chance on this new form of media, which can be just as crazy as the old forms, but has a more loyal audience, which we really appreciate Mm -hmm. and which I think sponsors appreciate. So if you want to refinance your home, Hall Financial would love to save you money. You can email David at dhall at hallfg.com or call Hall Financial at 248-308-5000. Maybe it's your first home. Maybe it's your dream home. Maybe it's my little rental home. Maybe you want to take money out of your home. Give David Hall a chance and get lower rates, better options, and more personal attention. They have over 600 five-star reviews. Industry average for a refi is 44 days. Uh, Come on, obscure jersey. Give me uh, an obscure jersey. That would be, um, I'm a flying Zaga crap, uh, uh, who's a Russian player that never really made it with the Red Wings. Hall financial average is 19 days, which is... Uh, Still the captain. That's Eisenman territory. That's yep. pretty good. Ken Holland may not appreciate it, but we sure do. They will fight for you even if you have a dent in your credit history. 
Email at dhall at hallfg.com or call 248-308-5000. And thank them for giving the Soul of Detroit a chance to stick around for a while. Tell them ML sent you. NMLS1467435. You don't have to remember that, but, uh, but it's good to know. So we were hoping to start with uh, Rob Walchek. I thought he made a nice little visit with us last week, and we, we had some, some uh, off-mic conversations about his history of confrontations. He's probably the most prolific confronter in Detroit journalism history, I think. I mean, he was doing this before Steve Wilson. Where is Steve right now? Tom Izzo knows. He knows everything. Sorry, I'm everything's about back. everything's about yeah, Izzo. Uh, last thing I knew, Steve was in Florida. It's been a little while since I talked to him, but he left Channel Seven somewhat unceremoniously. Uh, tried to start a, a nonprofit investigative reporting consortium. Unfortunately, most of the people he needed to help fund it were the kind of executives who he had been chasing around. So that didn't really go oh, very boy. far. Yeah. And he got a gig in Florida working as an investigative reporter, which he was he was really excited about it. He had a good producer. He was going to start back in Florida, where he'd worked for many years, where he still lives. And he got really excited about it. And then a new news director came in, changed everything up. So they cut everything back, and they ended up telling him, um, you can still do what you do, but you have to shoot your own video. Which, you know, if you've seen our very well-produced investigations... Well, it's it's even worse than that because with night cam, you're getting all point of view. But when you're doing uh, an encounter with someone, you, you want to see that? both people on camera. Yeah. You know, what's he doing a selfie the whole time? And he's got kind of short little chubby arms. And your arm, believe it or not, <laughs> gets tired hanging out there for 15, 20 minutes. So my, my partner, John, when we do confrontations or encounters, not only is he working the big camera, but we have another camera stationed so you can get a wide angle of the whole thing. It's not something one person can do by themselves. And, and really, if it's going to be done right, you should really have a, a reporter and two photographers. So Steve basically said, this is going to work out. I think he ended up getting bought out of that contract, and I'm not sure what he's been up to since. I always like that shot where you see, um, you know, it must be that far away shot, and you see the cameraman running around to get a different shot. It's a very good action photo. Right. Well, because you never know which way the subject is going to go, and it's always nice to get the walk up where it's like, uh-huh. hey, Joe Bag of Donuts, you know, uh, Mr. Truth and Justice, Fox 2 News. And do you like doing that? Do you like, is that what it's called, the walk up? Uh, most people call them confrontations. Um, I, I mean, call them get, encounters. Does that because, get you amped up? Uh, you know, I mean, usually your heart's racing. Um, you know, your pulse is up. But you're also, if you've done it enough times, you kind of know what you have to do. And so mm-hmm. the trick is, you know, don't, don't, don't cut in front of the photographer. Don't stand in a place where no one can see the other person. So you want to position yourself. And then there's other things like um, you don't want to impede them. Uh, a lot of times now we'll have police or security involved, so you don't want to, you don't want to rough around with them too much. Although I've gotten banged around enough by those jokers, and you don't want to stop someone from getting into their vehicle or going through a door, or whatever they're trying to do. But you want to at least be able to get your question out so they can hear what you're asking, because the whole point, you know, some people just want the look, you know, the here I am chasing somebody down. I'm good doing it because I want answers. First time at, at Channel 4, we're doing a story on Mayor Kilpatrick's friends and family on the city payroll and how he said everybody in the city was going to feel pain and they were going to be cutting back. And so, you know, presumably his people would, Damn that. would suffer too. Of course, they didn't. So we went to go see his cousin who was working for the city. Uh, we got her at City Hall. She wouldn't talk to us. So I chased her all the way through City Hall, asking her questions the whole time. Security's yelling at me to stop. Finally, we get to the elevator doors. Elevator opens. She gets on. We decide we'll let her go up the elevator. I come back to the station, and I think uh, Karen Drew was like, so how'd it go? And I said, it was terrible. She said, well, show it to me. So we show it, and it's just me chasing this woman through City Hall who's not answering any questions. I'm just peppering her with, with questions the whole time. She's like, this is fabulous. I said, what do you mean? She didn't answer any questions. She's like, no, you're chasing her. So That's answering the question right there. That's good TV. Yeah, yeah. it's movement. Yeah, it was great TV. It was, was not great journalism, but that's when it kind of dawned on me, oh, so this TV thing may be a little different then. Well, do you ever watch a story? Because I sometimes see stories and I'm like, why is that news? And then it hits me. It's like, oh, because they have a really good video. Like, it clearly dictates a lot of the agenda on certain shows. So when I was at Channel 4, the news director at the time, 
his his mandate was uh, every story's got to either have hidden camera, a good confrontation, or amazing video. So that could be, you know, you're chasing down a bad guy. It could be you've got some great hidden camera video, somebody doing something they're not supposed to do. Or it could be a dog flying in the air on the back of a hang glider while he's playing a harmonica. Yeah. And it didn't matter what the hell that story was. If you had that dog in a hang glider with a harmonica, that was going on TV because that was amazing video. Or, or the uh, water skiing squirrel. So, so that was my first uh, confrontation uh, at, at uh, Channel 4. And I was never comfortable with those. And as you'll see watching our stuff at Fox 2, is I do it differently than almost everybody. I call first and say, hey, can we sit down and talk? And some people do because they don't want to be chased. They, they know the game by now. And other people don't, and we chase them down, and it makes for some pretty pretty funny videos. But Well, I think of the, when you're talking about that, I think of the Cushionberry. I mean, the one that we God. use in the intro yeah. where, the, where his security stopped you. Yeah, where, the, where they're shoving me up against the wall in a church. Mm-hmm. Uh, and by the way, uh, Detroit Police Internal Affairs, I'm not saying they're not good at what they do, but after watching all the video, they determined that I attacked the police officers. That by, jump, by, by flying backwards, I was somehow attacking the police. So uh, thank God uh, Alex Kornienko, who's one of our great photographers and editors at Fox 2, was rolling on the whole thing. Yeah. But it turns out that uh, sometimes, I guess, in Detroit, you can't believe your eyes. I didn't even so. know they did an internal affairs oh, investigation yeah. on that. Yeah, and the whole time I let them off the hook. I said, listen, I don't want anything to happen to these cops. My dad was a cop. I don't want them disciplined. I don't want them punished. I do want something to come out of this, though, where the, the department has a policy which says you can't manhandle Members of the public. I'm not even saying give the press special privilege. It doesn't matter. We have no more rights than anybody else. But you can't be putting your hands on citizens unless they're doing something dangerous, provocative, you know. And all I'm doing is trying to ask a, a public official a question. But Yeah, uh, if he would just answer some questions. When if you look at that video, you can see the look on his face. He knows it's coming. He's yeah. looking out of the side of his eye, smiling at it all going on over there. Like, there, you got what you had coming, smarty pants. Ugh. But uh, I've watched yeah. you on television. You're a real beauty. Steve Wilson used to call these things unscheduled accountability sessions. <laughs> and he was a master <laughs> at jackpotting people. The only time I'll go grab somebody without calling him first for an appointment is if I think I'm going to catch them red-handed doing something they shouldn't be doing, like John Alumba not going to work, yeah. you know, that sort of thing. So, so we do those, but, you know, and, and Rob, Rob always jumps people, and uh, he, he and I have a little different philosophy about it, but there's also a reason why he does it the way he does it. I'm going after public officials who have a place to go to work, who usually stay in their same house, so we know we'll get them eventually. With Rob... He's going to get people where he may have only one shot at them because they're they're uh, they're in the wind, you know. They're they're hustlers, they're scammers, so they don't want to be in the same place twice because the people they've ripped off are going to be looking for them, and they don't want to be caught. So so with Rob, he pretty much has to strike as soon as he can. If he calls somebody and says, "Hey, I think you're doing something wrong," they're off to the next you know hovel or wherever they're I think hiding I'd out. I'd rather go after public officials. Because some of the people Rob goes after, I, they seem to be very adept with the courts, and it just would eat up a lot of his time. Oh yeah, there's outside. a lot of frivolous suits. The other thing yeah. is when when we do it with public officials, does he get sued a lot? <clears throat> um, on advice of counsel, I'll let Rob okay. answer that. But I'd say that there are some knuckleheads who who hassle well, I think him it's... sometimes repeatedly. I mean, we'll win a case. He he wins all his cases. Yeah. I mean, Rob's but it's back a, a thousand. Yeah, it's it's a hassle. It's expensive. But what ends up happening is sometimes the same nitwits will repeatedly sue, which is very very frustrating oh, because once they've been the told no, time to go. Yeah, but there's no double jeopardy apparently in the civil courts. But one of the things that uh, that's really funny about um, the guys Rob goes after and, and me trying to hold public officials accountable, I never have to worry about somebody pulling a nail gun out of the back of their truck and then just yeah. unleashing a clip full of, uh, you know, yeah, but you've almost heavy been, iron at You've me. almost been run over a time or two by uh, a city-owned car. Yeah, and I've chased a few cars. Rob, Rob likes to dog me for basically looking <laughs> like some mongrel running down the streets after the bumper of some public official. But uh, Hey, once again, good video. Yeah, we, we, we do what we got to do. And, you know, talking about Rob, I don't want to take us off topic, but i got to give you a little update on, on the basketball game. Oh, that's right, yes. So, Rob, after on this show, 
guaranteeing a victory or essentially guaranteeing a victory against Channel 4 delivered. And we were getting smoked. We were, get, we were down by 10. Uh, uh, Channel 4 has some very good guards. There's one guy in particular. One of them, 6 foot 11. They got a, a, this bald dude, white shorts, like the, the, the Fab Five shorts, you know, mm-hmm. the, more like the surfing jams or something. Mm-hmm. This guy is a demon out there. I mean, he can ball like nobody else. He is insane. So I got my obligatory two or three minutes in there. Did you um, score? I, uh, I had a rebound, I, I, as I recall. It's kind of a blur. And then on a fast break, one of our really good guys, I was clapping for it. Uh, it was two on one. And I'm coming down to wing, and, and he, <laughs> he feeds it to me. And I don't know whether it's a bad pass or I'm just bad. It could be both. Actually, more than likely, it was a good pass, and I'm just bad. <laughs> and uh, oh, I kind of tried to catch it as I'm looking up to do a layup. And, um, oh, and you took your eyes off the ball? Of uh, you know what happened so fast, and I'm so bad, I can't really say what it was. Hopefully, there's no video of it. But right. suffice to say, my man fed me the rock. I went to the hole, and uh, the rock kind of never got higher than my eyebrows. Uh. So I sat down and cheered for the rest of the game. But second half, man, Alan Longstreet went into beast mode. I mean, really? he's a monster. He was the MVP? Uh, he'd be up there. He was a game changer. Um, Randy Wembley, super guard. He was going head-to-head with this dude. It was, it was a beautiful thing to watch. Um, Corey Alexander, one of our producers, hit a couple of big threes. And Raheem, who's in sales, is just, he's a monster, man. This guy, when he... When he when he pounds the ball and gets his shoulder down, you got to get out of the way. You're gonna get you're gonna get killed. So who won? I feel I feel like the lead is being buried. I don't know who won. Down at half. Fox two won. <clears throat> really? We won in the end. Yes, it was it was a beautiful thing. Is that the first time local four has been beat? No, no, we had quite a run on them for a while, and then I think they won the last two or three. Oh, okay. So uh, so it was pretty. It so was comes back home. It was Where pretty tough. That's right, exactly. It's yeah, home. Where money was yeah. raised. It's like, like Paul Bunyan and East Lansing. It's just the way it's supposed to be. Oh, Lord. So after the game, we usually go to Mr. Joe's, but there were no bosses there. So I think people figured if we go to Mr. Joe's, there's no boss to pick up the tab. Oh, man. So it ended up just being uh, me Kent Culpert, a really good photographer, pretty good basketball player. Um, one of our retired um, behind-the-scenes guy, Dan Gabbert, and, uh, and Derek Kevra, who hurt his knee uh, just days before he's supposed to go on a trip to Paris. So he really put it all out there, and, and Kevra can ball too. So the four of us are sitting there at Mr. Joe's, and um, I got one of the happiest text messages I've gotten in a while. My, my youngest daughter, both my daughters work at the traffic jam, and my youngest is a server, and she had an envelope with her tip money in it, and she couldn't find it. She lost it. Uh-oh. And she figured, you know, these kids don't go to the bank as often as they should. Maybe because in Detroit, there's only certain hours you actually want to get yeah. caught at ATM. So she figured she had like 500 bucks worth of tips in this envelope. Couldn't find it anywhere. We turned the backyard over. We turned the house over, searched the cars. Couldn't find it. You can make that much money in five seconds. We told her, you've got to empty the recycling trash can, go through everything. Couldn't find it. We told her she had to go through the garbage can, which, you know, we have pets. Yeah. So there's a lot of bags in the garbage can that are full of crap, literally. (laughs) And uh, she had to go through all that. Couldn't find it. And she had pretty much resigned herself to losing this hard-earned money. You know, this is like the most money she's ever made, and it's gone. So she's kind of bummed out about it, but taking it fairly well. I talked to my wife. I said, well, should we give her the 500 bucks and say, well, you learned your lesson, but here's the money. You earned it, so we want you to have it. And she was like, hell no, because she's Greek. Apparently, that's worse than Scottish. (laughs) So I thought about it, because initially I thought I would give Sophie the money and say, don't tell your mom. Yeah. So I told mom first. You can't do that, though. So then I figured what I would do is I started a little savings account for the girls and because uh, one of them wants to be a teacher, put that shit in my motherfucking savings account. And one wants to be a graphic artist, so I figure they're both going to be starving. <laughs> so then I thought, you know what I'm going to do? So I went to go see her, and I said, you know what? I'm proud of you. You tried hard. You screwed up. Now you know. Don't let money sitting around. You went through all kinds of mess to try and find it. So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to put five hundred dollars in your savings account that you can't touch. And I said, and by the time you can touch it, that 500 bucks would be a thousand dollars. So you get the benefit of the money you earn, but you won't have access to it. And I thought that's kind of a good way to do it. Now at the same time, I'm thinking, damn, where am I going to get 500 bucks? But 
<laughs> I, I felt really good about it, and she was cool about it. She's like, okay, you don't have to do that, but thank you. I appreciate it. This is on Friday night. Yeah. Saturday, after the basketball game, I get a text that Mr. Joe said, Emily's my oldest daughter. Emily found Sophie's money in the backyard under the lilac tree, which is all what? the way around the garage, up against the fence. There's no way it could have gotten there, no matter what kind of storm was there. But nevertheless, she found it. Hmm. And it turns out there was Sounds a lot more fishy. than 500 bucks in it. So I told Derek and Kent and Dad, I said, next round's on me, man. I just saved $500. So well, that not was really. A, that was a, well, I don't. I didn't have to come up with the five hundred bucks now. Wait, this is really. Um, I'm intrigued by this. There was more than five hundred dollars in there. Yeah, yeah. Apparently, she had more tip money than she thought. What? This well, that's even more couple. ridiculous than not keeping yeah. track of it, not knowing how oh, much I, know. I had to lose. I know. And, this kid's a knucklehead. And how did it get out there? Uh, I think when she was taking some stuff out of the car, it fell out of her pocket or out of her purse. You have to understand the the, the women in my house. <laughs> to them, a car is not a conveyance. It's like uh, it's like a dumpster with a radio. Oh no! So there's all kinds of crap in this thing. You don't know what's in there. You know, in fact, I thought I had another kid for a while, but it turns out it was just you know <laughs> More crap. some of the organic stuff that they had left in the back seat had kind of formed into a, an entity, and it, it was short lived. It you know it couldn't uh, it couldn't survive. But I mean, there's that much there's that much raw material in these vehicles that life forms can can come into existence there's like it's like a petri dish with wheels i feel like i'm already seeing the seeds of that because as i take my five-year-old to school she uh you know we're never on time so she has to eat in the car she can't eat before we leave and she just leaves everything on the floor in the back oh so there's right now there's like a a plate with jelly on it and apple juice and Oh, I'm not going to clean it out. No, it's horrible. Lazy. It's horrible. Now, if you ever get stuck in like uh, a snow drift for like weeks, like you'll be okay. Old jelly, yeah, great. Yeah, they'll actually rescue you and you'll be heavier. <laughs> Probably. Because I don't know if that's possible. And with the cold, it'll be well preserved. But so, so the best news, we won the basketball game. But you did not save I $500. I saved 500 you bucks. You did not save $500. I had to buy a round of bourbons, but that's okay because we were going to drink those anyways. So it was very. Don't say you saved it. It's very happy. But you got to be the hero, so that's cool. That's better than being Longstreet and being MVP of the game. You're the bar hero because you got to pick up the tab. Well, it congratulations. Yeah, so we're very, very pleased, and now we got to now we got to defend the crown. Um, we are very, very happy to get out of that alive because, uh, as you know, uh, I had some experiences at at Channel Four a few years ago that uh, still still are with me. And we were talking about a video, um, a story you did there, and I asked you if it was online. And oh, you yeah. said, I don't think so. And I, I'm speculating that you, either they had it scrubbed from the Internet or you had them scrub you from the Internet. Oh, no. No, I, I had no authority. I would, they would have ignored my wishes. I think it's just a matter of there's only so much space on the server. So at some point. Uh, I told you before, that's the most fascinating thing to me about you is your time at Channel 4. If I ever sell this book, <laughs> it will be the best chapter in the book, guaranteed. Before we get to this great story, which I think is a great story, I want to take a moment and, and express my gratitude and and spread a little good cheer about a gentleman named Dr. Yaldo. When I was at Channel 4, I had LASIK done, and I, now I have 2015 vision, which sounds bad, but it's actually better than 2020. So I can read, I can read your license plate from across a parking lot. Unfortunately, now that I'm 50... I find it hard to read up close, so I use reading glasses. Now, there's procedures Dr. Yaldo does that will get you around that. So listen and learn, folks. Dr. Wiza, Drew and Mike sponsor for the last 15 months, and he's sponsoring all of us here at the Red Shovel Network, including ML Sola Detroit. Dr. Yaldo is Michigan's leading LASIK surgery with over 30,000 procedures performed. His CATS system is the world's most advanced. And here's the one I was talking about. The multifocal implants is the Rolls-Royce answer for people 50-plus that want to eliminate reading glasses and get 20-20 distance vision for life. Man, I could use that. In life, you look for what works, whether it's custom LASIK, the remarkable multifocal implants, or getting great designer frames from Dr. Yaldo's optical department. It's worked for you, our loyal listeners. So if you don't need LASIK, just go get some glasses. Mm -hmm. Whatever you do, get your eyes checked. Every year, get it checked, folks. It's usually covered by insurance. They can find all kinds of crazy stuff that you want to know about. Get a free evaluation to celebrate his belief in Red Shovel. Get up to half off on custom LASIK. Uh, Call 1-800-398-EYES. That's 1-800-398-EYES. Or go to YaldoEyeCenter.com. Back to Channel 4. So we had this story. Uh, I was working with uh, one of my former colleagues at uh, the Free Press because we would try and collaborate on stuff. 
And she got contacted by a story her bosses were not that interested in. I said, well, what is it? What is this? Jennifer Dixon's her name. And she said, well, um, I got this recording of a Dearborn cop calling 911. And I said, well, let's listen to it. Her bosses were not interested, but I think you'll see in just a second why I was very interested. I think I'm having an overdose of so is my wife. Okay, you and your wife? Yes. Overdose of what? Marijuana. I don't know if it had something in it. Oh, okay. Can you please send rescue? Do you guys have fever or anything? No, I'm just, I think we're dying. <laughs> oh, how much did you guys have? Uh, I, I don't know. We made brownies, and I think we're dead. I really do. Mm. Okay, uh, well, how much did you put in the brownies? I don't know. I, 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 Was it a bag? Who made the brownies? I, I, um, my wife and I did. Cuba, come here. Okay, get her. She's on the, that she's sounds on the delicious. Right now. Is she breathing? She's barely breathing. Is she awake? She, uh, I think so. Yeah. Okay, can you look? Pardon? Can you look? I, yeah, no, he's dying. Like he's laying right down in front of me. Time is going by Let's really, great really, 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 really slow. Time What's the score in the Red Wings game? <laughs> what? What's the score in the Red Wings game? I've got no clue. I don't watch the Red Wings. Oh, okay. I just want to make sure this isn't some type of like hallucination that I'm having. Oh, uh, why? What's the score say? Uh, three to three. Yeah, these days that's like hallucination. a hallucination. You know, like the, the Wings don't score three goals a game now. But. <laughs> so th- this officer, Sanchez, was a canine officer, and what happened was he had some weed that he'd been given to help train his dog to detect weed, and while he had it at home, he decided to cook up some brownies, and apparently he and the old lady were watching the Red Wings because at that time the Red Wings were in the playoffs, mm-hmm. and he got a little tweaked and freaked and called 911. Well, so we get this tape. We decide, okay, we're going to do a story on it. So we are uh, sitting outside his house, and we're hoping to catch up with him. Mm -hmm. So we're sitting on the house. Uh, We don't see him all day. We see Lourdes Duarte, who at the time worked at Fox 2. Now, remember, I'm at Local 4. Go up to his porch and knock on the door, and nobody comes to the door. And we're like, oh, shit. Channel 2 is on the story now, too. Which means instead of saying, well, if we don't see him today, we'll go catch him tomorrow. We'll get him the next day. It's like, no, no, no. If Channel 2 is on this story, we got to get him today. You know, we don't know if they're going to do the story tonight at 10 o'clock. Because at that point, you know, we have the 11 o'clock news. So we're already going to be, even if we do it on the same day, we're going to be second. Because they'll have it. So, like, oh, my God. So we got to wait for him. We got to wait for him. You know, uh, so it's getting late. You know, photographers are are unions, so they're on the clock. Bosses don't want to pay overtime. And this guy's name is Sanchez. So we see people going in and out of the house. We have no idea what he looks like. So that's like one of the worst situations when you're trying to catch up with someone. You have no idea what they look like. Who the hell is Eduardo Sanchez? So we see these guys coming in and out of the house. They're installing carpet. And they look like they're Hispanic. So finally, they're done installing the carpet, and they're driving away. And I said to my partner, I said, we just got to get them. We got to to catch up with them. So they're driving away. So we we, we follow them, and we're twisting and turning throughout the city. We're going through Dearborn, Dearborn Heights. We're going all over the place. I can't believe we stayed with them as long as we did. Well, finally, they pull over in front of a house, and the guy gets out. And I hop out with, uh, with my mic, and I say, uh, Officer Sanchez, ML Eric, Local 4. Or, no, what, what we, we were Rescue for because uh, uh, they were branding us with Ruth to the Rescue. Yeah. So it was Ruth to the Rescue and Rescue 4. So we're like Gladys Knight in the pits. Pips. Well, mm. it was the pits. But anyway, so I jump, I say, you know, uh, Officer Sanchez, ML Eric, uh, Rescue 4. The guy goes, K? Okay? I said, you know, well, you know, what's going on with those, with those pot brines? He's like, no say K, K S. He said, um, uh, you know, Officer Sanchez. He goes, no, 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 no. He holds up an invoice. He's a contractor. He's a he's a carpeting contractor for Sears. Okay. And so they had been laying carpet at Officer Sanchez's house. So we confronted the wrong guy. Oh no. We, we, we confronted some other Hispanic gentleman. Oh. And then we had to say, oh, we're really sorry. You know, apologies. You know, really sorry to mess up your day. Don't. You know, have have a nice day. Please watch Local 4. And then we had to tear ass back to his house to see if he had left while we were chasing these yeah. knuckleheads. Yeah. So, did, he, uh, did he? Who got him first? 
So what ended up happening was um, we ended up knocking on And what on happened the to the guy that worked for Sears? They just went about their business, probably just like, <laughs> I don't know what the hell that was about. But uh, And he didn't speak English, so it was really bloop, hard for us to explain. What a great blooper reel, though. Oh, yeah. I'd love to see his reaction. Yeah, so it was, it was something else. Uh, the greatest video you'll never see on TV. So we went back to the house. We, we did end up knocking on the door, and he came to the door, and he just he wouldn't talk to us. Yeah. But um, So we put the story on. And uh, later on, I talked to Lourdes because she's great. She's in Chicago now, I think. And I said, so, Lourdes, what were you doing on that porch, you know, last week? She's like, I have no idea. I don't know what we were there for. I can't remember the story. We weren't working on it. I think we had no idea what you guys were working on. I was like, ah! So they're just following? No, they just, what? there was some reason they had to knock on the door to talk to this guy. I have no idea what it was. Maybe they had the wrong address. I'm not sure. But they weren't working on this story. So we jumped oh. the gun thinking it was a competitive situation and it wasn't it just was one of those things where oh, that's uh, awesome that's great yeah so that was uh I'm not surprised he wouldn't talk because you know he's probably in some trouble too so yeah well so that story we did it the free press did it it went viral and once again you know i left the free press to go to channel four because they didn't want me to do the stories i do and it just kind of shows that their bad judgment uh, continues because this story <laughs> went all over the country all yeah. over the world because the recording was so crazy I think he ended up either getting suspended or losing his job. Was but but he was never sad. charged, even though he admitted uh, where the marijuana came from. Well, I think that was the other thing. I think that's why we got the recording, because somebody in Dearborn was pissed off that he had done this thing, and there was no no discipline, no action taken. So they, they, something did end up happening to him. I don't I, remember what I think what the it was, punishment but. of the video in 911 call is probably appropriate for what he did. Often the court of public opinion can render a, uh, a, a cruel and devastating verdict. I won't change my mind on anything, regardless of the facts that are set out before me. I'm dug in, and I'll never change. Very good. Very so. Very good. Very so. Very good infinity. Very so infinity plus one. No. So I'm taking a position that may surprise folks who have the wrong idea about Spartans. And that is, I think it's a bad idea to sell beer in Big Ten venues. I just don't think it's a good idea. I, I don't know how simply I can put it. Oh, you're wrong, but that's okay. Okay, and now it's time for Room 769. No, but uh, <laughs> this is a thing where more and more Big Ten universities are doing it. it. It tends to be the crappier schools, and I think the only reason they're doing it at Maryland and Illinois is because if you watch those teams, you need a drink, or well, they don't draw as one many more fans. reason to go. But Ohio State does it, and they've packed the house. So it's not just the bum teams. There must be some reason behind this. I'm not sure. I know Sean is usually half in the bag when he's watching these games on Saturdays. So I'm not sure what he's going to land on this. But Mark is a pure capitalist. He wants all that money. Yep. And you want longer lines in the big house? You want more people having to get up in that stadium when you can barely get up uh, if there's a fire drill? Well, I'll just say this. Um, I've been to the NHL Winter Classic when it was in the big house. I've been to a few of the soccer games where they sold beer there, and it's not a problem. Uh, I do think if you sell alcohol indoor, you know, inside the gates, it maybe cuts down on some of the bigger danger, which would be binge drinking. I just can't believe Mike once again. I, I, don't, I don't understand it. Are we a nation of children, or are we trying to be adults? Can we just well? Which nation are you talking about? The nation of Ann Arbor or the United States? No, I'm talking about uh, the United States. Oh, okay, yeah, the United States is a reasonable place. Ann Arbor is kind of a a leftist uh, hangout where you guys uh, are (laughs) burning incense and and couches, although nobody talks about it. Can we trust people? Right. Yes. I mean, if you can buy a a semi-automatic, why can't you have a beer at a football game? So now you want to sell guns and beer at the, what do you no, take, is this I'm an saying, economics class? You're going to sell butter no, there next? It's not. I mean, look, I'm not saying we should be able to buy a certain kind of guns, whatever. I'm just saying that's how we are. What was the original logic as to not allowing it to begin with? Because I know the NCAA, when they have their events and they take over an arena for, say, uh, hockey or the basketball tournament, a lot of times they won't allow it then. I remember in the Final Four at Ford Field, there was no booze. Yeah, and at uh, I don't think they sold beer at uh, the Final Four at LCA either. What is the logic behind false, that? It's a false puritanical ideal, like so many other parts of this country. That's really all this is. I didn't realize you were so devout that way, Michael. Hey, you know uh, me. I, There's nobody who likes a beer more than I do, but I can put it down for three and a half hours. I mean, come why on. why should you have to? 
Well, I should have have to usually because yeah. I'm stumbling into the stadium then to begin with. But yeah, because you, you have to load up. So, so because you can't control yourself, you want to control others. That's kind of where we're at culturally right now. Right? Hang up on Sean immediately. No, no. I I think if you go to see a game, you go to see a game. I don't need to sit there and drink booze the whole time. I don't need to have somebody next to me who's already out of control, getting more out of control. And frankly. Given every Big Ten stadium I've ever been in, I do not need more people having to take a piss. There's enough people in line as it is without filling them up with something that basically is one of the greatest diuretics and, known to man. And yet you bought a house in East Lansing and rented it out so people can binge drink. Youngsters can binge drink on your front lawn all day long before <laughs> I, 3 o'clock kick. I do not remember that part being in the listing. <laughs> well, it was sort of implied, though, right? No, I would you see now now who's stereotyping? Tail, uh, tailgating. My a, my a, rental property is right that. behind a mosque and a church. So if you want to come to my place can, and have evening prayers or go to mass, you're welcome to do that as well as tap a keg. So you can listen to the call of prayer while you get hammered. What <laughs> uh, unbelievable. I, I don't I don't get this, my man. And as far as you, you harping on Mark for being a capitalist or a corporatist or whatever, you go to these stadiums and you don't complain, I assume, about all the ads that you're inundated with all over the place, right? No, I like it because I think a Capital Area Airport usually sponsors the scores where they post them up and they say, uh, uh, you know, Wisconsin beating Michigan, um, Ohio State beating Michigan. We, I'm glad that somebody's bringing that message into us. You know, that's an interesting thing, too, about the commercials and the advertising because there is zero inside the big house, which kind of— Really? There is no ads. Anywhere inside that stadium, you'll see maybe Pepsi or, um, but no, not inside, not in your seats. You're not going to see it like the Masters. Uh, it's like the master tournament of college football. They don't do anything no, on the scoreboard. I thought I nope. saw commercials. Okay, only for the un- only university type events. Oh, it's wow. it's really weird to me that they do it. Um, like the hug in and the uh, let's read <laughs> a poem up. event. Shut, yeah, yeah. Some culture, you know, patchouli club. No, it, it's, it's, it all city <laughs> patchouli. Oh my goodness! In all seriousness, no, Mike. I think, and I'm gonna I'm gonna say Mike here for this as we get serious here for a second. I I, I think the drinking age ought to be 18. I think we ought to borrow the model what they do in Europe and demystify this a little bit. Yes. And uh, if we can send these kids off, I know it's a cliche, but if we can give them responsibilities to to be in the army. At that point, they've been driving a car for a couple of years, right? They can, they can vote. They can do all sorts of things. Why the heck can't they have a couple of beers? We know we wink, wink, because we know they're drinking beers right outside the stadium, mm-hmm. oftentimes on university grounds, and certainly in Michigan State's on university grounds. Every Saturday I drive up there in the fall, there are white tents all over campus. Yeah. And people are you getting are racial with it now? <laughs> Is it just the white tents that are to blame? Well, there's some, there's some green tents. Okay, too. then. How about Let's... That? Let's be equal opportunity. As a here. wise friend of mine once said when we were about 20, maybe 19, who also, he, this guy went to Michigan State, Stro. He said, if you're, old enough, if you're old enough to fight for your country, you're old enough to drink for your country. Well, I just want to know how this went from should they sell beer at, at football stadiums to should they sell beer and guns at football stadiums. Sean's <laughs> taking this a whole new place. I'm just trying to tie this into the larger culture. I know you don't like to do that. You like to pretend you live in a vacuum and you're a little... Gross Point uh, Mansion over there, and I get it with your false bullet uh, bullet dented car. And I got to tell you, eventually it's coming where all these universities will sell booze because they're at their lowest attendance rate since 1996. They're going to. Ha- I don't even want to say this because this this might blow his mind up here, Sean. But they're going to eventually have to pay the players something outrageous. So they're going to need more revenue streams. Let them earn. But so uh, that that's 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 a question that we haven't touched on yet. Is the reason why? You guys think they should sell beer at stadiums because people want to drink it. It's a freedom of choice thing. What the hell? Or is it really because, or why do the universities want to do it? Because they don't care about some high-minded ideals. They just care about money, money, yep. money. Both of them. Money. Yep. What's I, wrong with yeah. that? Well, Mark and I would probably say the reality is that's what they are. They're interested in money, for sure, revenue, if you want to you know, soft, soft pedal that a little bit. <laughs> But I think Mark and I, if I can speak for Mark here, um, I think we're talking about freedom of choice and just being adults. We, we got we got to stop acting like we're uh, we're all a bunch of kids and we can't handle it. You know, right? I just thought of some. Doesn't Michigan State sell alcohol in the suites? They do in the suites. Well, that's interesting. Why is it okay in the suites, but it's not okay in the bowl? Because you guys want to talk about reality. 
if you're a rich SOB, you can do whatever you want. So there's your reality. But that's another freedom of choice thing. It's a freedom of it's no, it's money talks thing. Well, I know, but that why does that make it okay? Because maybe they'll throw a beer down to you in the. Oh, that's cheap weak. Seats. I don't know. Michigan won't even sell that in the clubs. Really, there's no we'll alcohol in the suites at no, Michigan. I would have thought at least wine. I mean, really? So <laughs> it's not full. How, so how does Matt Riley get that way during the games? Oh, well, he, he's got an extra ticket. He leaves it. Does he have that Ron Mexico <laughs> bladder that he brings it with? Okay. Here's another thing, Mark. It's pretty rich. For those of you guys working you. security at Michigan State, we're talking about a different Matt Riley. <laughs> yes, Mark. Here's another thing about Mike. He, this is the guy who sold beer at Comerica. So he's in a ballpark yeah. where the a, average age is probably much younger than it is at even. Uh, Michigan State football games or Michigan football games, right? Yeah, but I, I didn't sell beer to children. Wait, that's a good point. Why is it okay at Ford Field but not Spartan Stadium? Because it's not a college facility. Um, the, the Tigers suck. And because there's no there's no tailgating before a baseball what is a, game. What is a co- exactly. no, I'm, talking about, I'm talking about Ford Field. No, I'm talking about the Lions oh. game. Why? Well, I, I don't even want to talk about the Lions. That, that, that whole thing makes me upset. But honestly, care. what does being a college facility have, have to do with it at all? Well, because when they say higher learning, they don't mean that your 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 brain has been somehow pickled. Oh, but but really? meanwhile, the players on the field, their brains are getting smashed and pickled. And that's okay. Yeah, you're okay with that, but you but you want to think of a year. I'm not okay with that. I'm just control. saying, don't don't pay them a salary, or actually, don't pay two of them a salary because there's only two of them that might get invited to pro day or the combine, and uh, go nowhere from there. Man, you are that's one nice old man. That you think of uh, college campuses as elementary schools and. I, I, that's, that says a lot, Michael. A lot let's, of faith you have in people. Let's just put it this way. I think of them as a place where people can reach a higher plane without having to get higher. Well, that's what Monday through Monday Monday through Friday and then Sunday are for, right? Amen. Uh, I don't know. I'm drinking a beer after soccer on Tuesday. I'm drinking a beer after hockey on Thursday. And then I'm Definitely drinking after a beer this on a the other five days of the week for whatever excuse I can come up with. So, And you so know you what? Know, you, I'm drinking enough beers it is without doing it in the stadium. So the vote is two for, one against, which means it's a bad idea. Oh, man, the geeks have inherited the earth. Can I do that? What a dork. Does him wanting to play with us again mean that he's turning into a geek or we're turning into cool guys? If Sean gets his wish and you can sell beer and guns at Michigan Stadium, uh, perhaps those guns will be turned on reporters by people who... Something like a grandiose leap for a segue. Well, I, you know, when you're talking about the big house, it's big ideas, big stakes, big paychecks, big buyouts, big disappointments, John Beeline. So I got to get past the Beeline thing. He was one, he was one of my favorite coaches, and now, Sounds he's, like it. now he's dead to me. There's a game out there called 3D Assassin. And it's because of 3D Assassin that TGF, a developer based in Brazil, is our Geek of the Week because the seventh mission in this game, it's one of these shooter games, is kill a reporter. Yes, if you have made it through the level where you get to shoot a gunman who killed several people at a pizzeria, if you get to kill someone who stole a backpack from a tourist, which kind of seems like an outsized punishment, I'm not sure... That that's, well, a, that's a capital offense. Uh, if you've taken out a sniper who's killing innocent people, and if you've taken out three men who are guarding a gang's weapon arsenal, you can make it to the level where you get to kill a reporter. And here's your mission. A journalist bribed a cop and will pick up a briefcase from the cop. The briefcase is full of sensitive documents. Make him famous in a different way. God. So I, I guess they think reporters out there trying to get famous, folks. It doesn't really happen, but uh, but yeah, if you uh, if you're really into this, you know, when you're done, uh, you know, eating your kettle corn and masturbating, you can play Sniper 3D Assassin and shoot a reporter. What are having a duck hunt? Uh, like, yeah, or Paperboy. Duck you, hunt. You, you want well, I mean, to mess shoot with something. journalists? Do Paperboy. You run down the street, throw your papers on the porch, maybe hit the window. Big deal. It's this, really interesting. The, the, they are becoming so realistic. They always they were always like Halo, you know, which is a little more fantasy yeah. type shooting. Or uh, I remember played Wolfenstein, where you're shooting zombies and stuff. Yeah, I mean, it's becoming too real world. Kind of fa- well, this is why it's so so real world to, for people like me who are in the media. Uh, you may remember on June twentieth of last year, 
A guy shot reporters oh, yeah. at the Capitol Gazette in Annapolis, Maryland. He killed five people, and two were injured. And, you know, this isn't an isolated incident. Somebody oh, sent no, a, no, a pipe no. bomb to CNN yeah. back in uh, October. So this is, this is real, where people are targeting reporters who are just trying to do their job, often underpaid and underappreciated. And, uh, and so, you know... You want to make money off of this? Uh, apparently, this thing's been around since 2014. <laughs> Ten million downloads in its first wow. month, according to the uh, according to the developer. And and again, this kind of comes back to the responsibility. You've heard us dog on the um, on the social media companies for not having any responsibility. These things are available from the App Store. Well, guess what the App Store says about this? They have guidelines that address violence in games and say if you're looking to shock and offend people, the App Store isn't the right place for your app. They say apps should not include content that is offensive, insensitive, upsetting, intended to disgust, or in exceptionally poor taste. How did this get through? Because they're app- making Apple's very money. tight on their... Yeah, I suppose. Making money. So, developer TFG, among the many... Rewards you're reaping for your tasteless and insensitive games. Congratulations. You're now our Geek of the Week. See you again. Sorry about that. I hate to start this segment on kind of a down note, but uh, for those of you who've been listening all along, and if those of you who just found us, don't worry about it. You can listen to all the back episodes. We really appreciate that. And with this Memorial Day weekend, maybe we're perfect beach companion for you uh, if you don't want to read at the beach or you haven't had your LASIK done. So you may remember that my very first radio DJ name, it only lasted for one show, was Rick Rock. Well, I... I have some bad news. Um, this month, at age 74, Richard Rock passed away. The real Rick Rock, who un- was not a DJ. He was a retired Warren firefighter, beloved husband of Lorraine for 46 years, loving father of Jennifer, treasured grandfather of Mila Michnik, Michik, Michik, brother of Connie, Laura, and the late Tom Rock and Bob Rock, Rick Rock. Oh, man. I didn't know you. You didn't inspire me, but rest in peace. Just the same. Cool uh, name. Yeah, Rick Rock. How can you go wrong, man? It's a great name. And his brothers. Very powerful. Tom Rock and Bob Rock. Very powerful. Can name. you say, uh, hey, we, be- we, better, we better stop messing with the Rock brothers are coming. Rick, Tom, and Bob. That's a great last name. It's like an avalanche. All these rocks. Come. It's like a rock slide, a rock pile. I mean, good stuff. So Room 7609, this is where we like to take uh, some underappreciated new wave bands or new wave tunes, maybe some great tunes by great bands you just never heard of because you only know the radio songs, and we want to introduce them to you. Here's a great tune from a great band. Maybe you know the other tunes off the albums, but this one deserves a little attention. This is a very well-known band. The Police with Rehumanize Yourself.
I like how he keeps saying rehumanize yourself there at the end, but how do you know that 12 times is the right amount of times to say it? I mean, why not 10? Why not 6? Why not? It just it kind of works, but is there some magic number to we're going to do it 12 times? Like there's 12 bars in a in That's a why he sting. I guess so. Or Gordon Sumner, oh, as yeah. his mama calls him. But I, I love this tune because it, it's it's the most upbeat sort of ska infused anti-fascist song you'll ever hear. Because if you listen to these lyrics, he goes out at night with his big boots on. None of his friends know right from wrong. They kick a boy to death because he don't belong. You've got to humanize yourself. Billy's joined the National Front, which is a notorious um, uh, fascist group in England. In fact, there's a, there's a great, great Morrissey song called the National Front <laughs> Disco that uh, really takes on the fascists and his guitar player, as you'd expect for a guy who hangs out with Morris, he's a little skinny guy who's like, you know, are you going to get us all killed? you really want to do this? Um, and it says, Billy's joined the National Front. He always was a little run. He's got his hand in the air with the other C words. You've got to humanize yourself. And as you guys mentioned on the Drew and Mike podcast the other day, in England, that's a much more acceptable word. Yes. Oh, yeah. It's almost like, uh, it's almost like calling somebody a dick. It's endearing, maybe, yeah. sometimes. You can be endearing. Yeah. I mean, it's, it doesn't have the connotations. Well, that sounded close uh, here that, that it does there. <laughs> but it's just a great tune, and it's got a strong message. And whenever I think of, uh, of Sting, I always think of... of uh, Tantric Sex? No, no. I find tantric sex boring. I uh, does take too long. Yeah, it's the pizza gets cold, the beer goes flat. <laughs> you know, uh, the video you got to turn the you got to turn the LP over after twenty two minutes. I usually need a breather. It's funny you say that because I'm, I'm reading uh, this article here, uh, and they're in inter- all of them, all three of them are being interviewed. Sting, Stuart Copeland, and Andy Summers. And Stuart Copeland says, uh, "Can you elaborate on this tantric sex thing, Andy? And I've been wondering about that. How do you keep it up for five hours?" And Sting says. The five hours includes dinner and a movie, and then um, they're kind of bantering back and forth, and Andy Summers brings, uh, let's rehumanize ourselves for a moment, and Stuart goes, well, I wrote that song, and Sting threw out all the lyrics as well, and wrote his own, and Sting goes, and Stuart, uh, what was your lyric about, love? And Stuart goes, I think it was about being lost in something to do with Rangoon. Okay, well, let's let that one slide. So it's almost like he's admitting that, yeah, Sting should probably just write the lyrics. (laughs) Yeah, no, I I think, uh, I don't know what Stuart Copeland came up, obviously a very talented guy in his own right, but this is this is pretty good stuff. So what do you think of when you think of Sting? So, okay, so Sting is from Newcastle on Time, which is a very sort of blue-collar English yep. community. Very distinctive accents and everything. and, and Adequate football team, soccer Yeah, team. They're, they're not bad. Good beer. Yeah. If you ever had Nuki yes. Brown, very good. So whenever I think of Sting, I think of the other famous guy I know from Newcastle, which is Paul Gascoigne, who was a soccer player for Tottenham Hotspur around 1990. Really? And I went to go see a buddy of mine at the White Horse Tavern in London. We were going to do some traveling. And at that time, Hotspur was huge. Mm-hmm. And Gascoigne, Gaza, was like the biggest soccer star in the world and certainly the biggest soccer star in England. But he was kind of a, a, a funky dude. He had all kinds of um, ticks and he was uh, outspoken and wild and just just kind of a, a bad boy and he eventually got sold to Lazio in Italy he's had some injuries now he's probably you know he's peaked and now he's kind of on the backside he was well received by the club's fan but he did not get along with the club's owner Sergio Cragnati who was sort of famous for bringing Lazio back up to the uh, the uh, the top of the Italian leagues because when Gaza met uh, Sergio, he spoke the only Italian that he knew, which was oh boy. Tua Figlia Grande Tete, oh, huh. which uh, roughly translated is <laughs> your daughter, big tits. <laughs> so it did not go well for Gaza in Italy. Uh, he ended up getting hurt, getting in trouble, uh, coming back to Rangers and playing pretty well for them. But, uh, but whenever I think of Sting, I think of the police and I think of Gaza and I think of his crazy tour around europe and i think of those great days of drinking warm beer in england uh and so so the police we all all learned some new italian today yeah we did i I don't know that you want to use that in polite company Eh. uh not the way to impress the boss no but uh but that's that's the police um and uh, and a little bit more uh we love to get your emails you can reach us at ml soul of detroit at gmail.com you can leave us a voicemail at 313 Butterfield 89070. That's 313 288 9070. 
We wouldn't be here without our sponsor. I mean, we love doing this, but, you know, hey, we have a lot of things we like to do for free. I'm not sure that uh, that this would make the cut if we didn't have some support. So thanks to David Hall and Dr. Yaldo. And guess what? There's another way. If those guys happen to wander out on us, you can become our sponsor. Mark, Mark, tell us. Uh, Tell us how we can get involved here. Website is mlsoulofdetroit.com. There's a little donate button on there. Anything helps, even though ML saved $500, quote unquote saved. Uh, any dollar, cent, dime, nickel, any of it helps. Uh, just click on it and it's uh, PayPal. And we, we promise we will Appreciate use it. some of that money. None's come in yet, but if some comes in, we will use some of that to buy uh, a round of beers or a round of bourbon for the uh, Fox 2 basketball team. So uh, check us out. You can find us iTunes, Stitcher. Uh, Google Podcast, you can subscribe, you can rate us, unless you hate us, share the show, and all our Red Shovel Network shows, that's the Charlie LaDuff No BS News Hour, the No Filter Sports with Eli, Denny, and Bob, and of course our flagship, the Drew and Mike Podcast. We appreciate you giving us this hour of your time, we know it's precious, and we try not to waste it, we hope you agree that we're doing our best and it's worth your time. You've been listening to the Red Shovel Network. Cyrus, take us out. Can you dig that? Can you dig it? Can you dig it? All the characters and all the places named are fictitious. And their similarity to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. (laughs) The weed of crime. Does not pay. MLL rig knows. <laughs>